Welcome, Biology 182 students. Here we're going to be discussing the kingdom Animalia. We finally left the plants and the fungus, and the protists, and we'll for the rest of the semester be discussing the animals. These are labs 36 and 37. We can find lab 36 on page 385 in your lab manual. We're going to be discussing four phyla. Periphera, which are the sponges, nidarians, which are the sea jellies, platyhelminthes, which are the flatworms, and nematodes, which are the roundworms. There are many pictures, some of which you're f familiar with, and others maybe not so much. In the top left, we can see a sponge, which has somewhat of a bit of symmetry, but not really. We have a jellyfish, which I'll be referring to as sea jellies, because they are not, in fact, a fish. They do not possess a backbone. We can see a small roundworm next to that, and a tapeworm, which is a type of flatworm. An interesting note on tapeworms, in the 1920s, eggs of the tapeworm were sold to help women and some men lose weight. Uh, however, that is an unhealthy choice, and I do not recommend that way. A Portuguese man-o'-war is not a sea jelly, but is a species of hydra that floats on the surface. We'll get into more of that later. We can see below that a sea anemone, which is like an, a sea jelly, but upside down. Corals are also in Nidaria. And we have a planarian, Dugesia, which is a commonly known flatworm that has little eye spots that are cross-eyed and something that look like ears, which are, of course are not ears. They're just little appendages for sensory adaptations. And then below that we have a fluke. We can find these in livers, in blood, and they can be ectoparasites. In summary... Most animal lineages arose in the ocean during the Cambrian, which is 544 to 505 million years ago, when oxygen concentrations increased dramatically. Now, of course, oxygen concentrations increased because of the plants that made their way onto land and the algae that was in the sea. Periphera and Nidaria Platyhelminthes and Nematoda are the most primitive animals. Sponges lack true tissues and symmetry, while Nidarians lack organs and bilateral symmetry. All other animals share the traits of tissues, organ systems, sexual reproduction, bilateral symmetry, contractile tissues, and being heterotrophic. However, there is one sea slug that lives off the coast of the northeast Canadian coast in which when it's born it follows all of those traits seen in animals however it can eat algae and remove the cellular membrane and the nuclear membrane and steal the genes of the algae to make chlorophyll and chloroplasts, thus rendering this sea slug nearly autotrophic. On a 12-12 day-night cycle, it can actually go a year without eating, but there are some nutrients that it will need, so it can munch on algae or rocks to get those. Sessile animals often have plant-like architecture, for example, sea anemones while mobile animals developed heads and compact bodies to facilitate direction of movement. For chapter 36, which covers the phyla Periphera and Nidaria, your objectives for your test are, number one, how are animals adapted to help them obtain energy, defend themselves, and reproduce, and how are these adaptations different from that in plants? Number two, what traits unite members in each phylum? Number three, recognize members of three major classes on the Darians and know the traits used to classify them. Number four, how does polymorphism appear in each class of Nidaria, and how does each stage contribute to the life cycle of the organism? And number five, compare feeding methods between these two phylums. Now we're in the kingdom Animalia. 
Let's discuss what animals are. Number one, they're all eukaryotic. They belong to the domain eukarya, which means they have membrane-bound organelles and a nucleus. They're heterotrophic. They eat for energy, and they also need organic compounds. They're responsive to stimuli, so they have contractile tissues or muscle. They're multicellular, which means they're organized with specialized cells. They do not have cell walls, like plants and fungus, made out of cellulose and chitin, respectively. They have true tissues, cell groups that serve special functions. We don't see that in sponges. They have a diploid dominant life cycle. So they have embryo, larvae, juvenile, and adult. Typically only the gametes are going to be haploid. And they exhibit polymorphism. So they'll have two forms in their life cycle, like the caterpillar and butterfly. And that occurs in many groups. Let's take a look at the difference between animals and algae and plants. So let's look at plants first. Number one, they're autotrophic. Now, that is vastly true, except for a few parasitic plants that survive off siphoning nutrients from the hyphae that are connected to other plants that are autotrophic. Number two, they have cell walls. That's true for the parasitic plants as well. Typically made out of cellulose and lignin, something we're familiar with as wood. However, there are many other compounds that can make up cell walls. Number three, they're a they have asexual and sexual reproduction. Number four, typically have nitrogen poor tissues. It's difficult for a plant or algae to get nitrogen to be concentrated in their tissues, unless of course they have symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria or other helpful organisms to help get nitrogen in their systems. Number five, they're typically non-modal. Um, now that's not to say that seas don't get around via animals, uh, but we do see some movement in the plant kingdom. Of course, we see Venus flytraps move fairly quickly to catch a fly. Number six, they have a large external surface area. That, of course, is to absorb a lot of sunlight and respire quickly. And number seven, we have haploid dominant life cycles and diploid dominant life cycles. All right, now let's look at animals. Number one, they're heterotrophic. Number two, they don't have cell walls. Number three, only sexual reproduction. Of course, there are many animals that have asexual reproduction. Number four, they're nitrogen rich. We see that in muscle. Um, it's bioaccumulation of nitrogen compounds via being heterotrophic. Number five, they're typically modal, with some exceptions. Number six, they have a small external surface area. And number seven, they have diploid multicellular stages. Let's get familiar with this cladogram of the kingdom animalia. We'll be studying all of these for the remaining labs in this class. You will need to know this entire cladogram. Animals likely evolved from a heterotrophic, one-celled protist that lived in colonies and became interdependent with the division of labor. Some cells performed digestion, while others produced gametes, for example. So let's look up at the top here, and we can see several divisions. We can see acelomates, which means they lack a acelin. We can see protostomes. We can see deuterostomes. We can see bilateria. And then we see coelomates. So let's, let's get into what those terms mean. Looking at the bottom, we can see a protist ancestor. Protist ancestor, single-celled, but lived in colonies. These colonies had these single cells that helped each other out, but if one of the single cells was to escape or fall off the colony, it would be able to survive on its own. Perhaps not as well, but still be able to survive on its own. We see that in modern protists like the coanoflagellates, which are collar flagellates. 
once we get into true multicellular life for animals, that means that if a cell were to come off the multicellular animal, it wouldn't be able to survive very well. It'd have to have very specific conditions which are created by the other cells. We see that in the phylum periphera, which are the sponges. So if you take some cells from the sponge and you remove them, they won't be able to survive very well in the ocean. The other thing that uh, sponges have, besides being multicellular, is they have something like collar cells which resemble coanoflagellates. Now we're going to jump. If an animal now has true radial symmetry and has true tissues, and only two layers of these tissues, an ectoderm and an endoderm, a state which we call diploblasty, then these are the sea jellies and sea anemones. Radial symmetry, you can guess, is something like they have four stomachs and four sides, four gametes and four pieces, so you could technically take a knife and cut them like a pizza into four equal pieces. Um, once we jump into bilateral symmetry, on the other hand, that means that you can only split the organism into left and right halves. Any other type of cut won't have a symmetrical yield. And we also see cephalization, which means the growth of a head that typically has sensory organs. The most primitive group that has this, these states are the platyhemunthes or the flatworms. They're also a protostome in development, and we'll get to what protostomes and deuterostomes mean later. Once we start seeing a pseudocelum, which is almost like a gut, those are the roundworms. As we further our way up the cladogram on the right side, a true coelom, and we have a whole bunch of organisms that have a true coelom. Arthropods, which are insect spiders and crustaceans, annelids, which are segmented worms, mollusks, which are snails, clams, and squid, and all those guys are protostomes. But then we have another group, the echinodermata, which are sea stars and sand dollars, and of course our chordata, which include vertebrates, and those are de deuterostomes. In there we see some radial symmetry in adults and the echinoderms, but the juveniles, the larvae of a sea star, has bilateral symmetry. So radial is only in one, one stage of life. Uh, we see segmentation, which is very useful if, you, if the organism loses a piece of its body, such as in earthworms and annelids. They can regenerate that because each segment has enough organs to help sustain it. And we see segmentation also in chordates, but not as repetitive as the annelids. Let's compare the body symmetry of animals. So some groups, like the sponges, are asymmetrical. They kind of grow whichever way benefits them at the time. They're more like plants in that way. Radial symmetry is like a pot. So you can see our sea anemone there, and we can cut it, just like I mentioned before, like a pizza pie, just like a pot. And we see that radial symmetry in sea jellies, hydra, and of course the anemones. But bilateral symmetry, again, that means we can split the organism into left and right halves only. Um, so these are all the other animals, and they typically have a head, and that facilitates directional movement. So the head is the guide to the rest of the body on where to go. Now, of course, humans uh, don't necessarily work like that, being bipedal and standing upright. However, typically your head leans forward in your body and is definitely the sensory organs that help guide us through our environment. In the Kingdom Animalia, we're going to start with four different phyla. Number one is periphera. That includes the sponges, of course. And the specimen we'll be looking at today is called grantia. And we want you to notice the spicules, 
and sponges and fibers. The second phylum we'll be looking at is Nadaria. We'll be looking at three classes. The first class is Hydrozoa, those are the hydras. And the two specimens we want you to look at are Obelia and the Portuguese man of war. Second class within Nadaria is Cyphozoa, those are the sea jellies. And the specimen we want you to look at is Aurelia, which is a moon jelly. And the last class in Nadaria is Anthozoa. These are the sea anemones. And the specimens we want you to look at are Metridium and some coral. The third phylum is Platyhelminthes. These are the flatworms. We'll be discussing three classes. First class is Turbularia, which is the planarians. And the specimen we want you to look at is Dugesia. Those are the little flatworms with the cross-eyed eye spots. Second class within Platyhelminthes is Trematoda. These are the blood flukes. We want you to take a look at Opus thorchus, Fasciola, and Schistosoma within Trematoda. And the last class we'll be discussing in Platyhelminthes is Cestoda, which are the tapeworms. And of course we want to take you to take a look at a tapeworm, Taneus soleum. And then the last phylum we'll be discussing is Nematoda. These are the roundworms. And the two specimens we'll be looking at are Ascaris and Trichinella. On this slide, the thing I want you to notice are the symmetries of sponges and the colors. So sponges can be marine, or they can be fresh water. They're the si simplest animals anatomically. They lack many of the features that characterize all other animals. So some of these have some kind of a form. In the bottom right middle, you see kind of a pink sponge that does have somewhat of that vase shape I mentioned earlier. But the interesting thing about all sponges is they're going to have a siphon, a place where they take in water and then digest it, the particles within, and then send out water out that same siphon. We'll get into another group that looks like this called the tunicates, but they have two siphons, an in-current and ex-current siphon. Now let's take a look at the phylum periphera in detail. These are the sponges. The word periphera means pores. That's because there are many holes around the animal to have water enter. Number one, they're mostly marine. So we find a few freshwater species, but the vast majority of species are in the ocean. Number two, they're multicellular, but they don't have true tissues or organs. They're the simplest of all animals. They're kind of like a colony of cells built around a water canal system. So if one were to put a sponge into a blender and not destroy the cells, many of those cells can reassemble. Number three, they're filter feeders. 80% of the food is too small to see with a microscope. So they have intracellular digestion by amoebocyte cells. Number four, they have asymmetrical bodies. Folded walls all the way around, increased surface area for feeding. Number five, the adults are sessile. However, the larva is mobile. And the, mar the larva will swim to find a suitable home. Number six, they exhibit asexual reproduction by fragmentation or budding. And we call those little buds that fall off gemules. Number seven, they also exhibit sexual reproduction, so they'll form gametes, and sperm is released out of the siphon into the water and siphoned into another sponge to fertilize its awaiting eggs. There's a few videos I encourage you to look at in the bottom left. You can see a video on filter feeding of sponges. In the bottom middle, we can see how they spawn, and the bottom right, you can see a sponge releasing its gametes into the water. Now let's talk about the anatomy of a sponge. But there are some terms I'd like to go over before we begin talking about the anatomy. One, a coanocyte. So that's a cell that has a flagella that draws water through porocytes into the spongocele. Spongocele means like a body cavity inside of a sponge, but it's not really. Number two, those flagellate coanocytes trap food within something called a collar. Number three, intracellular digestions occur, occurs inside amoebocytes, 
So we have to have an amoeba site that is next to one of our coanocytes. And number four, filtered water exits through the osculum, which is the hole at the top. So on the top right picture, we can see some of those parts of the cell we were describing earlier. We can see the coanocyte has a collar and lots of flagellum. And so it's going to draw in food particles. The food particles go in, and uh, the amoebocyte is the actual cell that does the digestion. So we see phagocytosis of that uh, coanocyte. Um, but they're, even though they're able to take the food inside of the cell, it's the amoebocyte that actually does the digestion. The amoebocyte is the cell that has the proper enzymes to digest food. We can see the bottom right hand picture are little spicules. These are made out of typically glass and some other compounds that give the sponge its rigid structure. So let's take a look at the whole sponge anatomy off to the left. We're going to start uh, as a water molecule, and we're going to go through the epidermis at the bottom, through one of those porocytes. So we go right through one of those into the spongocele. Now, some of those particles associated with the water are taken in by the coanocyte, and it's the amoebocyte, remember, that actually uh, does the digestion. Um, there's another layer called the mesohyl, and that's a layer of tissue that separates the epidermis and the collar cells. And then the osculum is at the top. We can see the water goes through there once filtered. Now let's discuss what spicules are. I mentioned before they provide support, but also defense. Spicules of different sponges have many shapes and can be fused in an ornate lattice. Beautiful glass lattice of the sponge Euplectula, which is in the bottom left-hand corner picture, is unusual because it often houses several species of shrimp, which can live protected within its osculum. Only one mating pair occupies a single sponge cavity. For this reason, the sponge was given to newlyweds in some Asian cultures as a symbolic gift the offspring escape through the pores in the sponge. So we can see some different shapes of those spicules in the middle picture. And something to note is some of them are made out of glass, so silica, and some are made out of calcium carbonate, and they serve different functions. Few species can be used in bath sponges, only having soft protein fibers in their matrix wall. So some sponges, if were to be used in the bathroom to wash a human or a dog, right, Mr. Pebbins, would fall apart quite easily. Uh, we can see off to the right those spongy protein fibers. So in conjunction with spicules, we also see spongy protein fibers that allow flexibility of the sponge and to allow support. Uh, to maintain its shape to keep that water canal system intact. Now let's move on to the phylum Nidaria, which means the stinging ones. We'll be discussing three classes within Nidaria. The top left hand corner is, we're going to discuss class Hydrozoa, which are the hydroids. We can see that they do look like the hydra of ancient Greek mythology with many heads, but those aren't heads. Those are actual tentacles. In the top middle picture, we can see the sea jellies, and that appears to be a box jelly, which is in the class Cyphozoa. In the bottom, we're going to be discussing class Anthozoa. Those are sea anemones and corals. See the bottom right-hand picture, a sea anemone, and in the two bottom pictures, we see two different types of coral. The one off to the right being a brain coral, and the one off to the left being a type of stag coral. Now I'm going to discuss the difference between diploblastic and triploblastic animals. So we're talking about germ layers here in the animal embryo. And if they have two germ layers, it's diploblastic, or three germ layers, that's triploblastic. A germ layer is a group of cells formed in the embryonic stage of an animal. Germ layers give rise to all of an animal's tissues and organs. All animals more complex than sponges produce two or three germ layers. Most have three.
Animals with radial symmetry, like sea jellies, produce two germ layers, the ectoderm and the endoderm, making them diploblastic. Animals with bilateral symmetry, like flatworms, produce a third layer between these two layers, appropriately called the mesoderm, making them triploblastic and enabling increased complexity in the body. Organs are derived from this middle layer. So let's go over it. The two layers, there may be a non-cellular jelly-like material between the ectoderm and endoderm. And you can guess where sea jellies get their name. We can see two layers, and the gut is in the middle. Now off to the right, we see a third layer, the mesoderm tissue. And that can have various internal organs that may develop from the mesoderm. And then the gut is in the middle, so rather than having a jelly-like component, we have an actual tissue. The things, the two tissues that both diploblastic and triploblastic animals share is the ectoderm, which is of course on the outside, typically develops into the outer layer of skin and related to those structures. And then the endoderm tissue typically develops into tissues making up the digestive system. So number one, the outer layer we call the ectoderm. Ecto means outside. It does develop into skin, sense organs, and nerves. Two, the middle layer is the mesoderm. Meso means middle, triple plastic only. So those that develops into the skeleton, muscles, circulation, and reproduction organs. And then the three, the inner layer is the endoderm. Endo meaning inside, and that develops into the gut and digestive organs. What are the unifying traits within the phylum Nidaria. Well, number one, they have all radial symmetry. We discussed that earlier. Number two, they have true tissues. So they have a nervous, contractile, and reproductive tissues. Number three, they're diploblastic, so they only have an ectoderm and endoderm. Four, they have something called a mesoglia. That's a gel which provides support for the body that is in between the ectoderm and endoderm. Number five, they have a gastrovascular cavity. It's a sac with one opening. So their mouth and the anus is the same opening. Number six, they're polymorphic, and meaning they have a polyp and a medusa phase. Number seven, they have stinging nematocysts, and those are used for killing small fish and crustaceans for them to eat. And their the last one, they have extracellular digestion. And this is all animals except sponges that have this. So let's take a look at our bottom right diagrams. You can see the polyp phase. And we can see the mouth and the anus, of course, is the same hole. They have something called a body stock. But things that are shared with the medusa phase are tentacles, the gastrovascular cavity, the gastrodermis, the mesoglia, the epidermis, and of course the mouth and the anus. In the bottom left-hand picture, we see a brilliant red sea anemone. But this is an anemone is a polyp, many of which can move around and are, and are not entirely sessile. Now let's take a look at nematocysts in detail. They're also known as nidocytes. We find these on Nidarian tentacles, and we know them as stinging cells. So let's take a look at our diagram. In the top left drawing, we can see we have our sea anemone, and on its tentacle, if we zoom in on its tentacle, we can see they're covered in these stinging cells or nematocysts. And then, once we analyze this nidocyte further, we see there's a nematocyst part that actually has a coiled barbed thread and a trigger that has many cytoskeletal structures coming from the trigger to elicit a response. Now, once that trigger hair has been moved, the actual nematocyst fires out, and it's the fastest reaction time in the animal kingdom. And that coiled thread is covered in small barbs with very large barbs at the base of it. This wraps around prey and is envenomating the prey, trying to cause the cessation of muscle contraction, like a fish. Now, to the bottom left picture, we see a human that's been stung by box jellies. Box jellies are very small, and they have very thin, filamentous, very delicate tentacles. 
and they catch fish, and the only way that they can catch fish is being highly venomous to sting the fish in such a time where those very delicate tentacles are not destroyed. There's a video uh, to the left uh, showing stinger cells being fired. Let's take a look at the polymorphism life cycle in Adaria. Let's start out with the haploid gametes to the right. See an egg and a sperm. Of course they unite and we have a fertilized egg that develops into a zygote, a blastula, and then a small multicellular larva. This larva is ciliated and can move around its local environment. 90% of marine organisms begin life as a plankton-like larva. Now, we're in the asexual reproductive phase. This larvae develops into a polyp. The polyp is typically sessile, although some polyps have a foot-like structure and can move around their local environment to gain better water quality to be able to catch organisms to eat. You can see they have the same structures we discussed before. Mesoglea, column, gastrovascular cavity, mouth, and a tentacle. Now the asexual reproduction begins when the polyp begins to bud off. And these buds flow down to the water and begin to grow and develop into a medusa. This is the mobile phase of an adarian. The medusa has mesoglea, gastrovascular cavity, tentacle, and a mouth, and can swim up and down in the water column. Not necessarily left, right, and back and forward, but up and down, able to ride the currents of the ocean around. Now, this is the sexual phase, and the medusa can make eggs and sperm, and then secrete those into the water, and of course that's beginning the entire cycle all over again. Now let's take a look at our classes in detail. The first class we'll look at is Hydrozoa. These are the Hydras. You can see in the bottom left hand corner the genus Hydra, which is a solitary organism and catches small organisms like Daphnia, small crustaceans and arthropods to eat. And the bottom right hand corner we can see a little bit more developed colonial hydra which we call Obelia. Same basic structure but many of them live together. And then in the top left hand corner we see a Portuguese man of war. This is like a hydra. It doesn't exhibit radial symmetry per se and it does have tentacles and floats on the surface of the ocean with tentacles dangling below. We typically don't see these like the medusae of other nadarians going up and down in the water column, although some can. These are highly venomous creatures, especially the Portuguese man of war, and if you see a fin like that poking out of the water, which is used to be pushed by air, please do not get in the water with it. Now let's look further at class Hydrozoa. Well, we can find them in ponds or marines, so they can be freshwater and saltwater. They typically prey on micro-invertebrates, like Daphnia. Daphnia is a water flea, very small. They can be colonial or solitary in their polyp phase. And the polyp stage is dominant, so we typically see them last longer as a polyp. They can have asexual budding and can make a small medusa. And they can also have sexual reproduction via external fertilization in the water, as we saw before. In the, the right-hand picture, we can see a hydra, we can see the mouth, a tentacle, the gastrodermis, and inside is that daphnia or water flea I mentioned, inside that gastrovascular cavity. We can see the epidermis on the outside. In the bottom picture is a, of a medusa of the hydra. Let's discuss the life cycle of the colonial hydrozone, Obelia. So, we're going to start out with the eggs and sperm, as we had before. We have fertilization, and that turns into a zygote. The zygote begins to develop into a blastula, and of course, we're at the diploid phase through most of this cycle. 
And then we call the little larva a planula. The planula finds a suitable place and develops into a polyp. You see the polyp starts out very small, and then we see asexual reproduction in the form of budding. And this becomes a mature polyp. We see many of these grow, and we have a colony now. And we have feeding polyps and reproductive polyps. The reproductive polyps make medusas, and the medusas have a gonad, which they can make eggs and sperm, which unite and fertilize into a zygote. Medusa are mobile clones of the polyp, but they enable dispersal and sexual reproduction. Something interesting about the Portuguese man of war, as I discussed before, is they are a colonial hydrozone. So there are many, many different hydras put together. They're not really a sea jelly. There's a video of that in the picture of the, in the left picture, in the bottom right hand side of that picture. After the sperm and egg fuse, larvae grow into four polyp types that form the adult colony. And those four types are floating, tentacle, reproductive, and digestive polyps. So there's some more information in a video in the bottom left hand corner, and we can see some of those different types of polyps in the bottom right hand picture. Let's move on to class Cyphozoa, which are the sea jellies, or commonly known as jellyfish. Number one, they're all marine. Number two, they can be from two millimeters to two meters across, such in the giant cannonball jellies uh, down in the bottom right-hand picture. You can see people swimming with them because their tentacles don't sting. Um, the medusa form is dominant, so they have a short polyp stage or it's completely absent. They're dioecious, which means two houses, and there are many deadly species, such as the box jelly in the bottom left-hand corner. You can see a sign that is showing people sea jellies are dangerous in the bottom middle picture. We can see some jellies, like the comb jellies in the top right-hand corner, are very brilliantly colored with many cilia that rotate and refract light as rainbows coming from the interior of the organism. And then we can see a picture of mesoglia next to that. A note I would like to say about jellyfish or sea jelly safety is if you are stung, of course, get out of the water and move to a comfortable location. Do not use water to wash off the stinged area. If there are nematocysts still unfired, they will be fired by the water. The chemicals you will need are either rubbing alcohol, which disables the nematocysts, or vinegar. Concentrated vinegar would be even better. If you do not have either of those chemicals to wash on the affected area, urine can be used, uh, and it will help alleviate some of the pain associated with the stings. Now let's look at class Anthozoa, which we're still in the phylum Nidaria. And these are sea anemones and corals. They only have a polyp stage, so there's no medusae that come off these. The polyps reproduce sexually or by budding, so they can release gametes into the water or by budding. And they can have solitary or colonial polyps. So up at the top right picture, we can see the polyp's mouth is in the center. We can see, of course, down in the bottom right-hand picture, our sea anemones that have a mutualistic relationship with many different species of clownfish. And in the bottom left-hand picture, some basic anatomy. We see the oral disc, some tentacles, the mouth, and the pedal disc, which is where that foot is. And as I mentioned, many sea anemones can move around in their environment. They do have a gastrovascular cavity. And it's a gut, of course, with one opening that serves as the mouth and the anus. But, of course, they do not excrete waste and eat simultaneously. They are temporarily divided. Sea anemones have solitary polyps. They do possess stinging tentacles, but oddly offer protection to many animals. So some animals do not trigger those hair cells. We can see a crab, 
that doesn't trigger those nematocysts, the nidocytes. See the bottom right hand picture, a type of shrimp. We see, of course, our clownfish that are inside of the sea anemone. And of course, um, clownfish have to rub constantly to produce a very large mucous membrane that doesn't trigger the hair cells. And in the top left hand picture, we can see a picture of a large sea anemone. Some of the sea anemones can get to be a meter wide. There's a video that shows some sea anemones can swim, so they're not entirely sessile. Some of them can be modal. As I mentioned, many of them have a foot to move around with. And the other group within class Anthozoa are the corals. And they have colonial polyps, and these are the things that build coral reefs. Hence the name coral reef. How it works is the polyp has tissues on the top with the tentacles and oral disc in the mouth for catching prey items, but they capture also calcium carbonate floating in the water and they make their own cell. And this cell beneath them is dead. And once that coral polyp dies, it leaves behind its cell, and then a new coral polyp doesn't occupy the same cell, but makes its own cell, thus growing the size of the coral. Some very large brain corals can get to be the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So coral polyps highly branch to trap prey. We see polyps emerge from the coral to feed. Of course, they can retract when they're scared. In the bottom left-hand picture, we can see a uh, many coral polyps coming out together. There's a video I encourage you to check out. Soft coral capturing prey. So we can have hard corals that capture that calcium carbonate and make a skeleton. And we have soft corals that don't do that. And they develop more of a protein structure. Here's a question for you. What would be an adaptive advantage offer, offered by the calcium carbonate skeleton secreted by hard corals? Of course, a coral reef has a lot of diversity in it. They are kind of like the rainforests of the ocean. However, the rainforest has many, many more species than a coral reef does. So they cover only 0.001% of the ocean surface, but contain 25% of all marine life. They support a $375 billion industry annually in the form of fishing. The threats that they have, of course, pollution, over harvesting of fish and coral, destruction, and climate change are all reasons for the decline of coral reefs. 10% of coral reefs are estimated to already be dead, and 60% of reefs are at risk globally. Uh, something interesting that I found in the pet trade, uh, many pet stores that sell saltwater organisms will sell coral. If it is a wild-caught coral, how many of the corals are obtained is a diver will go down with a waterproof stick of dynamite and put it into a crevice with coral surrounded by it and ignite the dynamite, breaking off and destroying a huge area of coral, and then the diver will return and collect what living pieces are left. So next time that you have a coral reef tank, Please ask yourself where that organism was obtained. If it is a captive bred individual, then you're fine. If it was obtained from the ocean, I do not recommend uh, promoting that particular industry. All right, now let's move on to new phyla, Platyhelminthes and nematoda. We can find this information on page 399 in your lab text. The objectives for your test. How does cephalization and bilateral symmetry help flatworms and roundworms survive? Describe the morphology of the two groups. List characteristics of all four phyla that have in common. And list advantages of roundworms and flatworms over sponges and nadarians. And list examples of roundworms and each class of flatworms. Flatworms and roundworms are more complex than sea jellies and other nadarians. 
because one they have bilateral symmetry so we can split them into left and right halves number two they have a defined head which we call cephalization and that's good for moving and hunting a sensory part of an organism that guides the rest and three they're triple plastic they have three germ layers and a germ layer is tissue that forms into different tissue types skin versus nervous tissue on the right hand picture we have a picture of two flatworms one is a marine flatworm in the bottom right hand picture so they can be very beautiful and then the top picture is of Dugija, which is our flatworm we'll be just looking at today in lab this slide shows kind of the diversity of flatworms we can see in the top left picture a flatworm that is brilliantly colored and this particular flatworm is very nasty to eat and bad tasting hence the color there's a video we can see of the sea worm and then a freshwater species in the bottom right hand picture our dugija we can see a video of those something interesting that can happen with dugija is they're regenerative so if we cut the dugija into left and right halves those two left and right halves will make two new worms if we cut them in the middle a coronal cut a front and back halves again those will grow into two different worms however if we want to keep the same worm and we just split the head but not the rest of the body then those two split ends will grow into two heads and we'll have a two-headed flatworm and then the same is true if you split the tail then you'll have a one-headed two-tailed flatworm there are many other ways of splitting these organisms to observe regeneration in flatworms discussing the difference between acylamates, pseudocelamates, and coelomates let's look at platyhelminthes and roundworms so acylamates, which are the platyhelminths, have no body cavity so we have a gut, of course, which is a hollow area from the mouth to the anus they have a skin on the outside from the ectoderm muscles and organs from the mesoderm and then a gut but no coelom pseudocelomates have a body cavity partially lined with a mesoderm so this is a roundworm we can see the skin on the outside and that's from the ectoderm muscles and organs from the mesoderm and the gut from the endoderm but we have this area that's not really a true coelom it's a body cavity but it's not connected in any way now coelomates which seen at the bottom have a true body cavity that's completely lined with mesoderm which means we have skin from the ectoderm muscles and organs from the mesoderm and gut from the endoderm but this new coelom that's completely enclosed by the mesoderm means now we can make a hydrostatic skeleton we can pressurize this new coelom and thus allowing locomotion for organisms coelom is a fluid filled cavity between the gut and body wall this fluid allows true organs to form and to move independently of the body wall we'll see this in future labs such as the annelids let's take a look at the platyhelminths overall traits so number one they have an unsegmented body we do not see any repeating segments two they're bilateral symmetrical three they have two tissue types four they're triploblastic which we'll see on the next slide five they're acelomates so they have no fluid filled body cavity so movement is restricted and very simplistic and six are many are hermaphroditic so they have both male and female reproductive organs and number seven they're free living and some are parasitic so um, we can see uh, the diagram at the top just to remind us from the last slide see a body cover covering from the ectoderm um, a tissue filled region from the mesoderm and then a digestive tract from the endoderm but we don't see any segmentation in the bottom right hand picture again is to remind us that some of these flatworms can be very big and vibrant the anatomy of Dugija is pretty simple so let's start at the bottom we see that there are some ganglia which are 
neurons grouped together. This does not constitute brain by any means. Now, there are eye spots that there's a white part and a dark part, and those see in two different wavelengths. They only sense light. They're not going to recognize movement very well. How these organisms find their food is via their chemoreceptors, which they smell very well. They have a gastrovascular cavity. They have a pharynx that can protrude from the bottom of the, the ventral side of the organism. And then we have ventral nerve cords, two of them, left and right ones, that run from the ganglia. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the class Turbellaria, which are the planarians, which we've been discussing along here. Um, in a coronal cut, we can see a branch of the gut, the pharyngeal cavity, the ectoderm, some muscle tissue, cilia on the bottom, the pharynx, and the mesoderm. Now let's move on to class Trematoda, which are flukes. They can be endo- and ectoparasites. Some of them can be in the blood, which we call blood flukes, but they can also uh, obtain nutrients from the skin of organisms. Two, they have an epicuticle that resists digestive enzymes. So they can even go into the stomach. And this epicuticle is very uh, difficult for pepsin and hydrochloric acid in the stomach of some organisms to penetrate. Three, they have life cycles that involve many hosts. So they'll go from host to host to host. And most of the body is dedicated to holding the reproductive organs. As with many obligatory parasites, their digestive systems were very, very simple because they're already getting the nutrients of the animal that they're in or organism that they're in. So most of their anatomy and physiology we devoted to producing as many eggs as possible to try to, and sperm as possible, to try and uh, spread their species to other hosts. Let's look in detail in these life cycles I mentioned of a fluke. So let's start at the top of the left-hand diagram, number one. Mature flukes in the blood vessels of the intestine of a human. So we've got this um, fluke inside the intestines. We do have male and females. We can see that picture there. Uh, the, the male is much bigger than the female. And then, number two, the blood flukes reproduce sexually in the human host. The fertilized eggs exit the host in feces. So if that human host were to use the restroom in water, then we go to number three. The eggs develop into, in water into ciliated larvae. These larvae infect snails. So they'll go into the snail host. Then we see number four, asexual reproduction within snails results in another type of modal larvae. So we have a second larval stage. And then Number five, those larvae penetrate the skin and blood vessels of humans, thus repeating the cycle. Um, you see in the top right-hand picture something very similar uh, to what I mentioned off to the left. And when humans get infected by these tiny little um, larvae that penetrate the skin, we call that swimmer's itch. And all of those little uh, red welts on the bottom right hand picture on that person's leg are of those larvae penetrating the skin. The last class of flatworms we'll be discussing is cestoda, which are the tapeworms. So these organisms lack a mouth and digestive tract, and they absorb everything they need through the skin. Again, gut endoparasites really don't need a mouth or digestive tract because they're already in the gut of an organism that has prepared a meal for them. They have a scolex, which is somewhat like their head, that has many barbs and hooks on it that adheres to the intestinal wall of the host. They absorb nutrients through tissue called the cuticle, and they have proglottids, which are self-contained packets of male and female reproductive organs. These proglottids 
produce many, many eggs. And we can have an intermediate, a mature proglottid, and then we can have a gravid proglottid. And most tapeworms require at least two hosts to survive. Here are some photos showing those proglottids, those repeating segments, which are full of male and reproductive organ tissue. Off to the right we can see that scolex with those many barbs they attach to the gut wall of their host. And in the bottom left we can see the whole organism from head to the last proglottid, some of which can reach several meters in length. At this point in a human digestive system, when they begin to grow over several meters in length, they can actually pose a problem by blocking the digestive tract in the small intestine. Uh, this poses a problem for the host to be able to pass waste through the system and absorb nutrients for themselves. The last phylum we'll be discussing is Nematoda. These are the roundworms. Now many roundworms are non-parasitic that live in the soil. There's a video of that in the top left hand corner. I encourage you to check out. Um, and we can see a Ascaris roundworm. We can see there's a difference between male and females. So males have this curved posterior end where females don't. We can see off to the bottom right a picture of a roundworm that can be many centimeters long. And others in the top picture which are microscopic soil creatures with only a few hundred cells. Now let's look at nematoda in depth. Number one, their habitat is every ecological niche from marine to freshwater from the polar regions to the tropics. You're surrounded by these guys all over the world. You can't really get away from them. They're essential for most ecosystems to, to continue on. Number two, there's many soil species. They help cycle nutrients. They can be decomposers, much like fungus. Number three, they can be free living worms. And those can eat algae, fungus, microanimals, fecal matter, and decompose dead organisms. Number four, they can be parasitic on animals and plant plants. Uh, the dog heartworm is an example of a roundworm. Uh, five, they have an unsegmented body. Number six, of course, they're bilateral in symmetry. And number seven, they have a pseudocelum. It's a body, in ca a body cavity enclosed by one layer of mesoderm, which is muscle. So movements are more controlled. Different species feed on materials varied as algae, fungus, small animals, fecal matter, dead organisms, and living tissues. Free living marine nematodes are important and abundant members of the ocean. They play an important role in the decomposition process, aid in recycling of nutrients in marine environments, and sensitive to changes in the environment caused by pollution. In the top right picture, that's a reminder of what a pseudocelomate is. We can see the ectoderm, mesoderm, the pseudocelum, and then the endoderm, and then the digestive cavity in the middle. And the bottom right hand picture is one of an actual worm uh, that is coiled in many different ways. So now let's discuss the coordinated muscle contractions that result in locomotion for roundworms. They're aligned with muscles all the way around, and they have that pseudocele, which can be pressurized to make a hydrostatic skeleton. We'll have muscles contract along one side, and this causes the body to writhe from side to side or wiggle. So let's take a look at our left-hand diagram in the top drawing there. We can see to make one bow throughout the entire animal, we can have the muscles contracted on one side and muscles relaxed on the other side. But if we have two centers of muscle contraction, we can start to get that S wave go through the animal. And that S wave progressively moves, uh, allowing the organism to push on the substrate, whether it be water or soil, to move through its environments. So when the muscles on one side contract, the fluid-filled chamber changes shape and the animal bends. In the right-hand picture, we can see the hydrostatic skeleton of a nematode in cross-section. We can see the body wall, the muscle, and the fluid-filled pseudocelum, and the gut. 
so we can pressurize that fluid-filled pseudocelum on left and right sides and up and down sides in order to move the organism through its environment. Let's discuss a little bit of the pathology associated with nematodes. So they can cause diseases in humans, other animals, and plants, but one particular condition called elephantiasis is where a nematode will occupy the lymph nodes of a human. Now the lymphatic system is for draining uh, the cellular fluid that surrounds our cells into the venous system of the cardiovascular system. And each lymph vessel drains into a lymph node. Now if those lymph nodes are blocked by these worms, then the lymph can't drain. What happens now is the cells become farther and farther apart from each other, spaced by the fluid, the lymph, that was normally drained by the lymphatic system. This causes edema, seen in the bottom two pictures. Edema typically occurs in the lower appendages because it's harder to pump that lymph back up due to gravity. Uh, it can become so bad that uh, the human loses mobility, and once that happens, the person lies down, and the elephantiasis can spread throughout the rest of the lymph nodes throughout the body. Um, there are many medicines that can take care of this worm. We see this in tropical regions, people that don't have access to health care.